Sometimes it seems to me that ha having grown up in the 60s, it started out black and white and ended up in color. But that's because TV did that. It started out black and white and ended up in color. But in another way, it, the 60s started out, anything could be black or white. By the time you got to the end, nothing was either black or white. And I think a lot of the reason for it was the assassination of Kennedy and the aftermath, the conspiracies and everything. And to help us get into this somewhat, we invited Gus Russo, who's writing um, a lot of things right now about Lee Harvey Oswald and the whole Kennedy assassination thing. Um, and I guess we're going to talk basically about your frontline piece mm -hmm. on, that's going to be on TV on the 16th. But just it, more generally, um, how did you get involved in the project to begin with? With the frontline project? Yeah. Uh, about two years ago, I wrote a documentary proposal for PBS, and I got a grant from uh, Jennifer Lawson at PBS to pursue it. We spent about six months out in the field talking to witnesses, came back. Uh, they didn't buy the project eventually, but it landed with Frontline uh, a few months later. And is this, I'm sorry, I'm lost. Is yeah. this an in-depth look at the assassination of JFK? No, the Frontline piece, uh -huh. the, the piece I pitched to PBS was an in-depth thing of, of the assassination, but the one they picked up on for Frontline was a biography of Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh, okay. First ever in-depth look at his life from start to finish. And, and this, this, now how did you get involved in, in screenwriting? writing? I think it's so fascinating. You went from being a musician to being a writer. It's so being bizarre. A like that. I have no idea. I'm just a dilettante, you know. <laughs> but whatever I, works. Whatever works. You know, I, I just <laughs> but go with the flow. I just did. I read a couple books on how to write screenplays and, and, and you know, pitched them. I, you know, it's not that hard, really, I don't think. It's pretty simple. Basically coming up with an idea. Yeah, the, idea is, the, the idea is strong. I think the form, they'll go with the form. They'll overlook if you have some small form errors, but the tough part is getting a inspiration. So right. you were in the field interviewing people about Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, I had been doing that for a number of years on my own at any rate before I wrote the original proposal. I knew enough about this, the subject, to, to feel confident. So you had a lot of material, right, exactly. and then you assembled the material. Exactly. You w didn't start from a blank slate exactly. on this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So how did you get interested in it to begin with? Well, I think everybody was interested to begin with yeah. if they were around when it happened. It's just right. a matter of it escalated a little more for some people than for others. I think the reason it, it took hold with me was I worked for Bobby Kennedy in 68 um, in a very small capacity. Uh, you know, in his advanced network of people. After and the election, or this was just prior to his the '68 election. He was he was eventually he was, he was killed running, in '68 right. before it came to the election. But in that winter prior to his assassination, I was working for him, and I heard some stories about the Kennedy family's interest, especially Bobby's interest in the assassination. So that really got me going into it, and I networked with people, and it just kind of grew. And then in the '70s, the House Committee had their hearings. And I knew well, there was a lot of mystery about Oswald for all of us because he was snuffed so quickly. Right, right. He's definitely the mystery man of the 20th century. We uh, did this frontline piece eventually that will air the 16th, November 16th, and we can't even say that we 100% know the guy, and we spent a year and a half trying to figure him out. He is a, an amazingly bizarre individual. Well, we're talking this morning about an interview um, that was recorded uh, in August of 63, just a few months before the assassination, where Oswald and um, Ed Butler, mm -hmm. that's name, Ed Butler, and uh, somebody who represented the Cuban expatriates, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Annie Castro uh, people had got, I guess, the old uh, uh, Batista or whoever. Right, right. Um, and Oswald, y you know, to me, knowing you were going to be on, I wanted to kind of remember what all this is. And, and of course, I, I couldn't get much of an idea about what I remembered about Oswald. So I'm thinking the nut, the lone assassin, all those sorts of things. And then I listened to this interview where he is representing the Marxist Party and the, and the Cuba Libre or whatever it was. He, he was working for the pro-Castro um, people as a sort of proselytizer in New Orleans. And this guy sounded together. He didn't sound crazy. He just sounded like somebody who was out there, like Pat Buchanan or anybody else making a speech for his, um, his political party. Yeah, he did sound very together on that program, but it turns out that his politics was very much on his sleeve. He, he wore it. It wasn't a deep felt thing, believe it or not. And I think the assassination of Kennedy wasn't a political uh, thing at all. Uh, his politics was just a way of belonging to something. He was the, the ultimate loner. I mean, his, he had an awful upbringing with his mother was a tyrant. Yeah. Uh, he, he wasn't able to socialize. She wouldn't let him socialize as a youngster, so he never learned how to do it. It's a very sad story in a lot of ways. So by joining a group, Marxist, whatever he joined, 
Uh, it was more just a reaching out to belong to something. A survival tactic. Yeah, just, yeah exactly. Like those loner kids in school who would write swastikas on their notebook and say, yeah, they really well, don't you won't it. have me. Yeah, they don't even know what it means, but right. they well, just do it. I, I want to pick up on something you said earlier, which is this introduction of color into a black and white world. And I was, as you said that, I was thinking about LSD and the, the, the fracturing and uh, reflecting effects of, of hallucinogens on the culture and what that was doing. But in a way, what you're talking about here leads me to thinking about ideology as a very powerful drug on the mind. Wow! Because because That's exactly this, what it was you know, for this him. is yeah. what changed his entire life. When he finally, when he got to Russia, we interviewed a lot of the people who knew him in Russia, and uh, they were amazed for this guy who defected at the height of the Cold War in the wrong direction to Russia. Nobody ever went to Russia at that time. They they couldn't believe he never attended one Marxist meeting, never went to any films. It was just something to do, and it, he didn't really believe it. Uh, so he was not really. He wasn't really hard. The Marxist. No, he probably read a few pages of. How long was he there? He was there over two years. Two years, yeah, right? Yeah, but he was mostly there going out with the girls and running around and trying to become, you know, a healthy, full, uh, a rounded individual that he wasn't for his whole life. Oh, gotcha, because in Russia, he didn't have uh, the same status that he did in this country right. as he an was, outsider he, in London. Exactly. He, he was say, a celebrity, as a matter of fact. Exactly, so, uh, a Marine. Oh, or actually, an ex-marine. Oh, did they call him the American defector or something? He, it was in the paper. It was in the, the Evening oh, it was Star. Oh, a big thing. And, 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 and when Minsky he, was a celebrity. He handed in his passport, and it was reported in the American papers. That Lee, and this is 1959. Lee Harvey Oswald yeah. has handed in his passport and in Moscow, and um, apparently seeking Russian citizenship. That's kind of like the character Gregory Hines played in, um, not to digress too far, in White Knights. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. So, Back what to is the title of the... Here. Oh, oh, I was going to just ask what the title of the frontline uh, piece is, so we can... Uh, it's called that. Who Was Lee Harvey Oswald? Okay. Yeah. Okay. November 16th, 9 o'clock Eastern. And we're going we're gonna to talk about some stuff today because this show is going to come on before Frontline and we're going to sort of like... Um, Tease you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit because we're going to have to have Gus come back and talk about the stuff that, that he can talk about after that show comes on because he can't scoop the show or they'll, they'll kill him. Right, you know? right. <laughs> so how do we know then that this was not his uh, uh, deep, heartfelt philosophy that he was espousing this communist doctrine? Well, only through the observations of the people who, who met him and came in direct contact with him, that's, that's their impressions. So we can only get it secondhand through them. But uh, that was a pretty unanimous feeling that, that when it really came down to it, he was more interested in the celebrity that goes with, you know, the territory of being different, uh, you know, and he wanted an identity. He had none. His mother robbed him of that. It's a, his childhood is an incredible story. Uh, he had no father. His father died before he was born. His mother was uh, very much of a domineering tyrant who moved him 21 times before he was 13 years old. Wow. Him, I mean, so the guy never learned to have friends or to socialize. Like Christian was Slater and Heathers. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kept getting moved. Um, <laughs> so he was you, always the outsider. In any school classroom he was in, he was always the new kid. And yeah. And just never got to meet any other no. kids. Now, I know this, this uh, research and, and uh, this project brought you in some contact with Oliver Stone and the movie JFK. Well, that was actually prior to all this. Oh, I, wow. I had written a, screen, a fiction screenplay about five years ago, which I sent to various Hollywood producers, and uh, uh, Stone's company picked up on it. This is long before anybody knew he was going to do or even thought of doing a movie on Kennedy. So he calls me up, and I thought, I was rich. He's going to buy my script. You know? <laughs> he, he said, oddly enough, he, he had been thinking of doing a Kennedy movie, but uh, the bad news was he didn't want to use my script, but he wanted to use my brain. Some of your ideas. Yeah, some yeah. Of my ideas. A fishing expedition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, as it turned out, he really didn't listen to anything I had to say. He had, he had his own ideas about Jim Boy, did he ever. Now, you know, this is, this is one of the funny things. It sometimes seems to me that um, of all the conspiracy theories, no matter how elaborate, no matter how bizarre, there is no theory that is more bizarre than the official one, the one that was <laughs> bought by the Warren Commission. I mean, you know, with the Stranger lone, than fiction. The lone gunman, um, the, the magic bullet, um, all the stuff about it. And yet Stone seems to have taken every conspiracy theory that anybody has ever had, with the possible exception of something involving Lyndon mm -hmm. Johnson, um, and, and wove them into this fascinating three-hour movie that was like part of my French, but more full of shit than a Christmas turkey. <laughs> but but when you when you saw this thing, did you um did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it uh, partially because I was on the set during the making. It's wonderful to be part of a forty million dollar film to mm. see how this all wow. comes together. I mean, it was just and to see the final product. It was from an artistic standpoint. I just loved uh, you know seeing the, the the final thing. Yeah. But uh, story wise, it was just a, just a story. You oh know? man, it was it, was, it wasn't it wasn't history. No, it wasn't history. Um, 
I, I, I feel like getting into more of it, but I know since we're going to have to go pretty soon, let's... Uh... Well, let's let them know that they can tune in and see Gus Russo on another episode after the airing of the Frontline episode. And we'll really try to find out who the real Lee Harvey Oswald was. Right. What do you say? Thanks, Gus. Sure. Thanks, Gus. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks.